Welcome everyone and uh, welcome to Google. Um, we're happy to have you here with us for the speaker series for our second exhibit. Um, this is part of the digital arts exhibit that we're holding at Google in collaboration with um, um, the project room at uh, the Chelsea Art Museum. Uh, so initially the idea behind the exhibition was um, an idea by Josh Mittelman, a colleague of ours, uh, who thought that Google should be more involved in the local art scene, especially in the local digital art scene, um, and maybe that the effort would eventually lead to a collaboration between digital artists and Google. Um, so this is our second exhibit, and we're very happy to be um, holding the speaker series with two great speakers today. Um, our first speaker today was going to be Rachel Armstrong, um, and I'll have to read this because it's a long list. Too many qualifications. Um, she's a medical doctor, a multimedia producer, a science fiction author, an art collaborator. So we have an exceptional person here. Um, and her current research is on architectural design and mythologies about new technology. And you've probably heard about living off architecture. So she's going to be giving us a talk. And um, you guys can ask her some questions towards the end. And after our talks end, you could also look at the exhibit outside. OK, thank you very much. Well, it's uh, been a great pleasure uh, for me to be here in New York today, um, particularly as I had to walk 40 blocks um, in the rain <laughs> and realized um, after about block 10, um, that New York road engineers don't appear to know <laughs> how to build drains. Um, secondly, that made me realize also that architecture really is about dryness and that no matter what city that you're in, rain is always a surprise. Um, which leads me actually to, to the materials that I'm working with because actually they are designed to work with wetness. Um, and I don't know if anybody has managed to go around the exhibition just, just now. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to look, so I can't tell you exactly where it is. But my contribution here are some uh, black and white films, which I did with Michael Simon Toon. Um, and essentially, they are synthetic agents made from simple oil and water um, that have lifelike properties. And so the talk I'm going to do now really relates to why I'm interested in life as a technology and how that is applied in a design and specifically architectural context. And the example that I'm going to use is the work that I've been doing around the city of Venice, which, as you know, has rather an interesting and tempestuous relationship with water. So essentially, I'm designing living materials for the built environment. And I'm going to start with a quote written in 1771 that starts According to Mr. Blainville, who usually is trustworthy, one can predict that in less than a hundred years will Venice be totally united with the rest of Italy, and you can walk dry shod from Italy to the city. What we're really bad at is predicting the future. And what we're really good at is somehow surviving it. According to scientists, life was extinguished many times on early Earth before it finally established itself 4.5 billion years ago. The Earth's environment is not kind. And for any structure on its surface to persist requires a huge amount of energy. In nature, even mountains are moved. So what makes life so resilient? Well, the answer is we don't exactly know. But it's embodied. It's robust. It's flexible. And it's able to change with environmental fluctuations so that it keeps its contingency at every moment. Because when it doesn't, it no longer possesses that special quality of life. Life has this ability to persist, which is unlike any other persistent structure on the Earth's surface. For example, the city of Venice. And I know 
I'm personifying madly here, but this is to get my point across. For Venice to persist against the forces of nature, the environment, the changing climate, it's standing there in opposition to all this, and it's had to ally itself with the contemporary technologies of the time, not because of its living properties. So Venice, when it was first established as the city-state between the 12th and so the 9th and the 12th century, was dependent on agrarian technologies. Essentially, this meant land drainage because of the resources of the sea. And with the settlement, then it needed the construction of canals for transport and the use of wood piles to shore up the foundations of the developing settlement. And these, of course, form a large part of the city, even today. Now, with the advent of industrial technologies, great wealth and power came to Venice. And it came with a price. In order for the Industrial Revolution to create the opportunities for growth and proliferation and wealth creation for the population of Venice and also the, the surrounding um, countries with which Venice was trading, required the top-down, intensive, energy-expensive processes that gave atomic precision control over matter. And that had a huge environmental cost, and one that Venice is still paying today. This is an industrial park set just north of Venice on the mainland called Marghera. I sometimes work in the laboratory there in the rather um, tube-shaped tower. It's situated between an oil refinery and a shipbuilding yard. So when you leave the lab at night, one is confronted with chimneys that are set alight with toxic gases and the impression of buildings that are moving as these ocean liners are being assembled and constructed on moving frameworks. It's very, very surreal. So then, is it any wonder that environmentalists are protesting wildly about the proposition of the Moses Project? Here's some graffiti on one of the walls on a house in Venice, protesting about the Moses Gates, the 78 mechanical gates that are set to be installed in the lagoon of Venice, and rather like the Danish King Canute, are there to drive back the tides, because the Aqua Alta, very much like the shoreline environment, is not kind. As you walk around the city, you start to see the damage that the seawater, and particularly the salt, ravages on the brickwork. You actually start seeing the very material substances within the city of Venice, the very fabric, are being digested away by the giant stomach of the elements and the, the, the lagoon substances. You can see efflorescence here quite liberally. It's like the icing you know, that's, that's been dusted over the walls. You can also see how very much the marble and even the concrete that's been stuffed in the holes in the brickwork um, is, is suffering as the, the city fabric tries to retain integrity at this very destructive interface. And you see all kinds of architectural desperation as you walk along the city. And here you see um, lion-like claw marks in the, in the, in the fabric of the, the marble. And you'll also see odd bits of concrete pasted into these holes that can take the fist, you know, size of a fist, like someone's fired cannonballs into the um, brickwork. And you'll see them also filled with rubble and sand and rubbish and even chewing gum. You. But there is hope. In the oddest place, perhaps, in a public garden to the east of Venice, is an oak tree. It's no ordinary oak tree. This is a very special oak tree. It's at the centre of a very special building, the Canadian um, Pavilion, which was constructed by Enrico Perissuti. Now, the oak tree, oak, oak tree is special because it stands right in the middle of this building, which is wrapped around it according to the shell of the nautilus, which is a mollusk, a squid-like mollusk, that has this banded structure. Uh, 
And underneath the natural canopy is another canopy, an artificial canopy, a cybernetic canopy, constructed by architect Philip Beasley with his collaborator Rob Gorbe. And the golden fruits that you see within that canopy are fruits of my own enterprise, um, some special <coughs> chemical fruits, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. But this is the Hylozoic Ground Project. Essentially, it fills the entire building. And this cybernetic forest literally responds to fluctuations within the environment. The passage of air causes the feather-like filters to flicker and shed showers of dust into the atmosphere so you can actually visualize the passage of the air movement through the gallery space. Those long tube-like structures in the center of the gallery are actually swallowing tubes. And what they do is they extend and contract with hydraulics that are connected to the cybernetic sensory systems distributed throughout this forest of, of sensors and effectors. Also under investigation, of course, is the presence of people. And these swallowing tubes actually are fitted with hairy tongues. And as you approach them, the sensors detect your presence. And they raise their hairy tongue-like structures up to lick and tickle you. There are also artificial crickets, which are those grape-like structures, which are just to one side, above the, the, the light structure that you can see um, um, to, the, to the left of the um, swallowing tubes. And they actually scratch against each other, and they make this sound that's a bit like a cicada. So in this rich synthetic ecology are the fruits. Now, this is one type of fruit. There are many types of fruit. And this one is a self-evolving chemistry based on the properties of inorganic substances impregnated into a gel-like matrix. And this is called the Lysergan reaction. It's a precipitation diffusion reaction, which is a load of, <laughs> a load of jargon, but essentially what it is, it's an embodied form of um, fractal productions. These, these chemistries um, gradually distribute themselves through space and time and form very elaborate pattern structures that are being driven by the forces of gravity and fueled by the chemical interactions in which they're um, contextualized. But this is the particular fruit that I want you to, to have a look at. As you can see, there's some um, opacities within its structure. And of course, this is all fueled by the, um, and speeded up by the LEDs that are placed underneath some of these fruits. And as we go closer, we can actually see it's created of two layers of oil, and within them are cell-like structures that are highly colored. In fact, those colors are there as indicators to show the public that something is happening. And something's happening at a very, very, very slow rate, because actually, I've had to slow this all down. Because believe it or not, and this is one that's being shown by um, its reaction or its um, response to the LED, um, because believe it or not, this is actually a very rapid process. So here is a film taken by my chemistry supervisor, Martin Hansuk, who actually invented this technology. It's called a dynamic oil and water droplet system. And what you're going to see is a qualitatively new kind of technology that's been called living technology. What's new about it is that it's inherently complex. It is not controlled by push-button technology. It does not respond according to the same laws of operation that we've been accustomed to over the 19th and 20th century with mechanical and digital technologies. Essentially, this simple oil droplet in a medium of water, a little bit of soap, um, and a lot of wriggling, um, is a complete technology. You can't take, you can't break it up into components. It exists as a whole from its essence, from the time of its birth. And what I find really amazing about this particular sequence is that for me, this is not only um, technologically a birthing process, but I think also metaphorically, it is heralding a new age in computation. This is a form of material computation in which the material itself is actually able to make decisions and take actions 
depending on its environmental context. So there are two ways of programming this agent. One can either program it according to its environment. So it behaves in a lifelike way. It can move around its environment, as you can see here. It can sense it, so it will follow a gradient. It operates for a primitive form of chemotaxis. It undergoes complex reactions, such as the shedding of a skin or even the production of a shell. Not only that, it likes other protocells. So it doesn't just operate as a lone agent, but also in colonies. And in the video that I've got installed here, you'll actually see some of these population scale-like phenomena which actually have not been described using computational modeling. They, they are exhibiting in populations phase-like phenomena so that it's almost like quorum sensing in bacteria, if anybody knows what that is. Essentially, bacteria operate according to their own little set of rules, and then when they're working in a population, they all start talking to each other. And when there's a quorum present, whether it's six, whether it's eight, whether it's 6,000, suddenly there's a population scale signal that is passed amongst these primitive bacteria. Actually, some of them are very sophisticated too. And it causes um, a huge movement of other bacteria towards this um, population, which has found something interesting, normally food. Um, and then it creates this mass scale um, migration towards the signaling center. So when these bacteria have reached a quorum, they're able to make a new product that they don't make when they're less than a quorum. These protocells seem to be able to communicate along those lines, even though they do not possess any DNA. So we can engineer them. So we can either change the surroundings so they can follow different traces in the environment, or we can actually load up the body of the agents itself with some chemical information. And so this is the final species of fruit that I've created. And this is one that can take carbon dioxide out of solution, which is dissolved both from the venous water in which this um, agent has been um, placed, and also in the respiratory gases that are breathed out by the gallery visitors. And what you're seeing is copper carbonate being dissolved in a halo-like structure around the protocell that's worked its way down to the bottom of the pear-shaped flask in which it's being housed. So what could this be used for in an architectural context? Well, I showed you some of the buildings along the canal sides in Venice. Well, what I've been able to do is to actually program oil droplets um, using this chemistry to actually create scar-like structures made of carbonate, which is like limestone, that bridge the gaps between brick rubble. So this is brick rubble that was collected from a walk around the city, or scooped it up, put it into a Petri dish, took it back to the lab, and then created a, a paint-like substance, a watery paint. So this material, un unlike the architecture around New York, which dumps all its water onto the street, wasting valuable resources, um, is, is actually conducive to watery environments. So you can actually start seeing that these, these, these blob-like structures are starting to produce milky um, deposits as they repair the gaps between the brickwork. But not only that, they actually create a shell around the brickwork itself, which is fixing carbon dioxide, and also producing a protective layer that delays, perhaps, the corrosive effects of the highly saline and corrosive environment in which these buildings are um, situated. And really, uh, if, you, if you keep applying this, this paint, um, then you build up a form of carbon dioxide um, uh, capture and accretion around the, the wall substance itself. And so literally, you know, with, with various paint applications, you can build this artificial shell-like structure around the masonry. Within the next 10 years, certainly, maybe even within the next five, um, it is likely that these agents will be able to reproduce. Currently, I've seen it done on an ad hoc basis. So essentially what DNA seems to do is to stack up the chances of cell division. However, even without any DNA, these protocells actually divide and they fuse. It's a random process. So one can wonder whether or not this actually constitutes a form of synthetic life which has been created using a bottom-up approach. So it makes us wonder what it is that we're 
thinking about when we're thinking about lifelike processes. Technically, though, this is not alive, and this remains a living technology. Really, really interestingly, there are no more than about three or four chemicals um, being used um, in this particular um, substance here. It's fat, water, um, a bit of surfactant, which is like a soap, just to break down the very high pressures that form surface tension around the um, oil droplet because of the reaction between oil and water. Of course, oil has this schizophrenic relationship with water. It loves it on one hand and it hates it on the other hand. And any disturbance in populations of oil molecules um, in relationship to a water interface causes great amount of movement. And this actually accounts for these physical um, phenomena that we see with these um, dynamic oil and water droplets. So what could we do with a system that's able to accrete a little bit of carbon dioxide? I'm just saying this is not geoengineering scale. Literally, this builds a crystalline layer around it. Um, and and, and how, co how can we use this as an architectural or even a design device? Well, propositionally, we've come up with an idea that may provide a way that illustrates how living technology is qualitatively different to the industrial and digital technologies that we currently know. So in contrast to the Moses Gates, which propose to keep back the tide, what we've decided was that the protocells could actually be released into the lagoon and programmed to move away from the light-filled canals where they'd make their way to the darkened foundations of Venice, which, as you'll probably know, are built upon wood piles. On reaching this low energy threshold, they can then produce their carbonate and create these little synthetic um, shells around the wood piles. And gradually, they accrete and form a reef-like structure underneath the city. And so the city of Venice is currently standing on soft delta soils with stilettos. By creating a form of accretion underneath the city, we're changing those stilettos into platform boots. And therefore, we're attenuating the gradual sinking of the city of Venice into the soft delta soils. Obviously, Venice's problems and its relationship with the environment is complex. And certainly, accretion and the spreading of the point um, load of the city is not going to be enough to solve all its problems. But in some ways, it does demonstrate how these living technologies might actually engage with the environment and create outcomes in a qualitatively different kind of way to the industrial and digital technologies that we're used to. And this is a future Venice scenario where the reef has accreted underneath the city. And as you can see, by capillary action through um, evaporation, it's starting to form this protective layer around the city. And you can see under the Rialto Bridge there that they're actually um, rather beautiful stalactite um, structures, um, which I'm sure <coughs> tourists will be breaking off as lovely souvenirs as they pass underneath them in their gondols. So what else could these kinds of technologies do in the built environment. This is a drawing of speculatively being able to create carbon fixing surfaces on um, future cities. We don't need to create new architectures. We could actually use this as a new form of retrofitting where we can create um, embodied energy, return the, the kind of the positive impact of architecture or allow our architecture to impact positively on environments rather than negatively. We could also use these surfaces to trap carbon dioxide and use sunlight to create biofuels. And we're actually working with the Cronin Group at the University of Glasgow to do exactly this. So really, this gives rise to the next generation of solar panels, which don't produce electricity, but biofuels directly from sunlight and atmospheric carbon dioxide. What's also very neat about these technologies is because they're based on the properties of life, they're ubiquitous, which means that every community, providing it, can, providing it has cooking ingredients of oil and water and maybe some inorganic chemistry, could actually engage in exploration 
of this technology. And ideally, we're not quite there with the recipe yet, but what we'd like to do is actually use mobile phones um, in developing countries and SMS the recipes so that people can actually make these materials for themselves and experiment on them. Because as I've demonstrated, they're very environmentally contextualized. So for example, a protocell system made of exactly the same ingredients is going to perform very differently in Norway to an equatorial country. And it will also vary differently on you know, levels above the, the sea. Um, and one of my ambitions is to send some of this protocell technology into space because I know that it's driven by chemical and physical forces. And of course, microgravity is going to change the performance of these droplets. And I think this would be very useful information for us um, when we're actually trying to design these on a larger scale. What we're currently developing is a manufacturing platform for these protocells. We're um, working with uh, people with 3D printing expertise to literally um, create a birthing platform through which our little protocells are released into a watery tank, into their, into their uterine environment, and they would use um, 2D um, uh, ink, uh, uh, inkjet technology to actually then give them specific chemistries. And that way we're going to actually be able to um, quantify and be much more specific about exactly how much chemistry is required in a particular droplet of a particular size in order to create a particular um, kind of outcome. At the moment, all these experiments are done by hand. So I'm, I'm just, um, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just um, wind up now. So essentially, I think really for, from the perspective of living technology, I think it's really relevant today. I think in the context of architectural and environmental uncertainty, what their value is, is that they can actually respond to unpredictability in, as, as a real-time event, rather than relying on, on models um, in order to anticipate future events that may or may not take place. And in other words, it responds to immediate changes in the environment, just like life does itself. Thank you. Anyone got any questions? I was looking, okay, there was a, a question there, gentlemen. I, I heard you using uh, words like uh, rapid process and random. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, what, what's the predictability of it maybe getting out of hand not to be pessimistic? Because it sounds you know, wonderful. I was wondering, uh, would there be like a maintenance issue or control factor which would be taken into account if, if once it gets going, once uh, it gets going? I think it's a really good question about control of the technology. Living systems, I think, and the control of living systems, I think is something that we're already familiar with. And the way that I, uh, I describe this is it's really like cooking. Okay, you, my, my grandmother used to make cakes. Okay, if she had some eggs and some butter and some sugar and some flour, she was going to make cake. Now, whether she put chocolate in there or rum and raisins or whipped it up with her you know, great big forearms, you know, which you could just strangle geese with. Um, you know, each time she made a cake, it was cake, but it had different flavours. And it depended how hot the oven was, you know, whether you know, there, there was a, a change in the atmospheric pressure. You know, all these complex factors came into play when she was actually making cake. They were always delicious. And essentially through her art and her practice and her expertise and her familiarity with working with materials, she actually understood intuitively the parameters. Now, this particular technology is actually much less complex than making a cake. So my point is that the way that we engage with it is based on the principles of complexity, but that doesn't mean that it's unknowable. What we can do is we, we have a good idea by creating these um, systems through which we're you know, going to evaluate them much more specifically. We, we create conditions um, in which the probability of a particular outcome is, 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 is likely. We can never say 100% certain, but that doesn't mean that the, the technology itself is out of control. Also, um, these are very dependent on resources in their environment. So when they run out of food, they just stop. They go to sleep. One of the 
nice things about the solar panels is that unlike green roofs, say, for example, which actually respire at night. So when plants and photosynthesize, great, they, they fix carbon dioxide. But when the lights go down, they're reading the same stuff as we are, and they're actually creating carbon dioxide. So a solar panel um, in, 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 the, in the dark is actually just going to go to sleep and wait till the sun rays come up again. It won't be using any of the oils that it's been making during the day when it wakes up again. And so I, I think, I think the, the techniques of control are much more like agrarian practices, cooking, this kind of, you know, dealing with animals, you know, herding cats, that kind of thing. Obviously, you know, some, some chemical relationships are going to be more awkward and tricky to get working than others. But I think the, the, the risk is actually the precarity of actually working, not in the fact that it's, that it's actually going to go mad and you know, take over the world and turn it into grey goo. Um, but obviously, you know, nothing is 100% certain within a system like this. However, I, I think that this is something that we know. And I think that, that, you know, obviously one would do lots of field tests before doing a Venice scale project. Um, but I, I, I don't think this is something that we've never come across before. And there are, therefore, I feel very confident, you know, that, you know, that my grandmother's recipe never turned a cake into a sausage roll. And that this kind of approach would never really create a degree of surprise that was totally unmanageable. Um, and what's quite interesting in, 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 in parts of the film that's um, uh, on display is that there's a, there's, a popu there's a population scale event. Just, just watch out for this bit. It's about two thirds of the way through the film. What you get is a home team of protocells. They're just building these long, stringy-like um, uh, structures. There are probably about 10 of them, and they're all just minding their own business, having a chat amongst each other. They, you can see these little chemical bridges forming between them. And they're just gradually creating these, these long tails. And over to the, on, on the film, it's over to the right of the film. You, you get a few waiting people, you know, waiting protocells, kind of, you know, wondering what's going on. That they're very social and just have, have a look. And I'm personifying, and I know this anthropomorphizing, and I know it's all wrong scientifically, but this is the best way to describe it. So home team, away team, away team come to check out home team. There's some kind of scuffle. What's going on? All of a sudden, they all part, and they shed these long plume-like structures after them. I have no idea why or how that happens. I know that it is based on principles of physics and chemistry. I know there is some form of exchange between them because there was no information within these agents to start with to actually specifically ask them to do that. So I, I think with complex technologies, we will actually get very interesting phase changes that are extraordinary phenomena, but not necessarily means that it's that it's out of control. I think I think it's more to do with uh, the capacity for surprise, but surprise within a very um, predictable solution space. There was a, a lady over there had a question. No, they will never have DNA. No, they'll be able to reproduce themselves, which is yeah, which is which is different. In other words, it won't. They won't have um, agents that are vectors to to exchange with biological systems. Right. What's quite interesting about them, though, is that they are very alien. They're, they're, you know, despite possessing um, a, an organic body, um, they are actually quite alien to biological systems. So they are an alternative form of biology. Um, uh, Lee Cronin describes it as an artificial biology, as opposed to a synthetic biology, which is the modification of, any, of, of a known biological system. So, so they, they, they work in a qualitatively different way. Yet, I think they will have medical implications. So, for example, um, currently one of the biggest um, killers today is heart disease and arterial disease. Um, what's really neat about the protocells is that they're, they're little slow-release capsules. 
And if we put in them um, an agent that can digest uh, cholesterol, which we can't remove through mechanical means, which is the way that we scrape out arteries at the moment, um, we can actually introduce um, these agents into the, into the heart very specifically through radio, um, uh, sort of uh, radiographic control guided mechanisms. So you ca cardiac cath. Um, to the point of the blockage or if you see a furring up of the artery and then release these agents and they will literally digest away the, 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 the chewing gum on the inside of your, of your heart vessels even before you've had a heart attack. See, because we can digest out a clot using streptokinase, which is, which is great, we can do that chemically, but if you've actually got coronary artery disease, then you literally have to create a bypass or a mechanical um, put a mechanical thing through it and you know that that's risk of um, uh, you know destroying your arteries so so essentially we will use them inside the body but in, in in alien areas where biological systems have not been able to create cure so can you imagine no more heart disease you know because we're, we're putting arterial deposits um, into our bodies you know around about the age of 21 um, so if we could manage to engineer these so we can actually also whistle and call them back um, that would be the other thing. It would also mean that people with kidney and liver damage who currently have a lot of problems with treatments because they can't metabolize and remove drugs introduced into their body through their clearance systems, they could also benefit from these kinds of things. Okay, sorry to interrupt, but we have to move to our second speaker. We'll take the rest of the questions in the end. Um, okay, so this, our second speaker our second speaker tonight is Mitchell Joachim. He's a leader in ecological design and urbanism. He's a co-founder of Terraform One and Terrafuge. And he's an associate professor at NYU. And one bit of trivia I really liked is that he has been chosen by Wired Magazine in 2008 to be as one of the 15 people the next president should listen to. So let's listen. I, 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 I run an organization in Brooklyn, New York called Terraform One. My co-founder, Maria Ailova, is here. And uh, I see some of our students and some friends. So you may be familiar with the work. So this is going to, I guess, be a description to those who haven't seen it before and may be slightly uh, uh, skeptical of the work we do. And I, I certainly am looking forward to the part where Rachel and I can have a conversation here together with many other minds, because we've, we've, we've talked about what it is that we do and the kind of the alliance that we have and the kind of commonalities that we've been working towards. And it seems to be very, uh, well, extremely interesting, very exciting, but a kind of a new field. And we're not sure exactly what that is just yet. So maybe some of you can chime in and, and let us know. So um, uh, the work at Terraform One uh, falls under these kind of three meta themes which is the idea of the city, ecology, and mobility, which leads to a new theory of design, which is ecotransology, which has come from a long history, standing on the shoulders of giants previously, Buckminster Fuller uh, would be one of them, about looking holistically at the design of a city, doing everything we can from the doorknob to the democracy. Right? The designer thinks about all aspects of the city. So it's not limited to scale, it's not limited to some kind of silo of design, but thinking about design in all aspects. Uh, and kind of fighting this, this kind of thesis or this current crisis of the uh, climate change. So here is a drawing uh, by one of, uh, kind of my favorite artists, kind of a curmudgeon guy named R. Crumb, who is thinking about uh, the environment in this case in one particular drawing. And uh, it sums it up uh, quite elegantly, I think. The first part about the environmental debate here I've listed as zero is the idea that the world will end, right? Through some, uh, you know, uh, some, some, some f feet of, of acid in the ocean or, uh, you know, uh, acids in the sky or, or temperature changing, etc. we are not going to make it. And we usually have some sort of an association of time, which is we've got about 20 years to fix the problem or we all die. And I think this has been a big message in the sustainable movement. And I'm not a supporter of the message whatsoever. I think the first thing you do if you tell 
uh, average Americans, which I'm sure no one in this room would be considered an average American. Uh, uh, and I don't think any American would consider themselves average, thus the problem. But if you start telling them that uh, we're going to die because of the energy we consume, the first thing they're going to do is leave the lights on, you know, use the air conditioner all day long just for their cat, and buy the biggest possible car so they can speed up and down uh, to live life to its fullest right? before they die. Because they don't want to be like those other folks who are very responsible. So that's kind of, a, I think, a big part of the American mindset, and it's prompted by this, this, this theory of eschatology, the apocalypse. So I don't go there. Uh, the technological fix and the ecotopic is something that we do find our work falling in. It's somewhere of a merger between those two meta-themes. Technological fix being through some silver bullet, some act of geoengineering, right? Uh, 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 we will solve our problems. John F. Kennedy said it best, if man created problems, Man can solve problems. So this is the kind of the, very, the science will save us uh, uh, idea, and, and with policy backing it up, of course. And the ecotopic is this return to the ways and traditions of nature, the kind of vernacular learned from nature, and we can dwell again on the earth peaceably. So I, you know, I, I'm, I think that's great, but uh, I think we can't ignore 100 to 150 years of industrial progress and technology. So. Um, the work that we, like I said, kind of incorporates everything about the city, and it's been done before. So here's a drawing that's uh, over 102 years old. It's King's Dream of New York by Harry Pettit. And this is where a designer has holistically reconsidered the city. And this is a proposition about the future of New York. And uh, here you can see dirigibles connecting into skyscraper uh, ports or docks on the terminus of skyscrapers, moving into circulatory cores, bridged clusters of skyscrapers, and then below you can see a canyonated system of mobility where pedestrians are on arcaded walkways, uh, horses and buggies, fast moving transportation, slow moving transportation are all kind of separated, designed holistically by one designer. We do this, uh, I guess, professionally as a nonprofit at Terraform. Uh, here's us on the cover of Popular Science last month. This was a, a, a big deal for us. We were very happy. We're not sure what kind of semiotic pulse this, this, this sent out. If you read it on the blog sphere, there's all sorts of angry folks saying that this can't possibly be the green city of the future. And they start saying X, Y, and Z, and, and there's a consistent argument. And through one image, it's very hard to communicate what the future might be like. I think what's important here is I'm going to talk about many of these different technologies and ideas that are involved in this drawing, and I'll unpack them slowly. Uh, but but uh, the, the, the most important thing about this image is that we want the future, if it happens, right? Uh, we want the future to be fabulous. And I think that that's what we're trying to get at. At some point, it's got to, not only an aesthetic driver, but it's got to be a place that, we, that, that we've always wanted to get to. And of course, that's in a, a kind of collective mind. Uh, collective mindset. So we do some real research. We do some real numbers. We do the back of the envelope equations. We make a lot of mistakes. We screw up a lot of experiments. I will show you none of those mistakes here, but I'll kind of show you the kind of the end results of some of that research. Here is a, a kind of a, a drawing at looking at the entire history, for instance, of mobility in the city of New York and how that relates to ecology and energy. So you can see somewhere on this chart, and I, I didn't bring a, a laser pointer, this is another one to it. But you can see somewhere at the end of the chart that we're looking at vehicles that are networked, vehicles that are human powered, soft vehicles, vehicles that talk to one another and stacking vehicle systems. Right? So at MIT, where I did my doctoral research, we were kind of charged with designing the car of the future. I thought that was well a crappy idea because the future eventually will happen. They'll look at our car 10 years from now and it'll be slightly uh, anachronistic or laughable. So we want to design technologies or a lexicon of ideas that would fit into every vehicle everywhere. So here is an example of a wheel. The wheel is the car. You add three of them together and you get that a three-wheeled vehicle. We have drivetrain, suspension, motoring, and a modicum of intelligence in that particular wheel. Here's one of many iterations that we performed, uh, looking at taking those wheels and applying it to various kinds of structural systems, canopy systems, and network systems. So here we have uh, 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 what we call something called the city car. It is a stackable car. It is a shared ownership model, so you don't own it. You buy into it like a utility or zip car. The frame articulates or stands up, reducing its footprint by 33%. The next car comes in and interlocks with that vehicle. Right? And you can stack about 330 of these on a New York City block 
as opposed to 34 SUVs. It's a Facebook on wheels. It's a drive-by-wire technology. There's no mechanical linkages. You can take the middle car if you so desire it because the stack can part in the center if you need it. And it doesn't have uh, any information like the speed that you're going in. It just likes to find out where your friends are. You tell it that's where you want to go, and off it goes. And it solves what we call the last five-kilometer problem. Here is rethinking the skin of these vehicles, making them soft and sending out a kind of message, something about maybe if you're in Boston, uh, the best thing you can do is have a car that says the Yankees rock. And I'm sure that would certainly create a lot of friends on the street, but uh, you can give got kind of a, a kind of a social like posture to your vehicle and a kind of city of these soft like cars moving around. And, you know, we have over or I did at least over 40 something variations here in those soft shells you, uh, with uh, air, air quilt technology. You can have a, a, an aperture that traces the driver's viewpoint, creating a kind of hole where the entire car can be naked and you can have a visor that tracks the sun in this case. Or here you can add just a simple armature to these wheels and the car can go vertically or spin on a dime. So now we're designing cars to fit cities, not the 20th century designed around the car, but forms of mobility to fit specific contexts, in this case, the city. They can enter the z-axis and I'll show that. And that there'd be clusters of these smart, soft, kind of uh, intelligent cars. Today, a vehicle is a shiny, precious metal box. Don't touch me, don't look at me when I'm driving in them. Certainly don't get too close, because I'll get scared. This is the opposite form of mobility. This is called gentle congestion. The idea is it's okay to rub up against the person next to you, say ciao, and continue on your way. Right? And here's how you phase them in the city. So the red vehicles are the hard hummers, and the blue are eventually these uh, series of translating soft cars that are intelligent, that move in a flock and communicate to one another. So when they find one of these hummers on the road, they cluster around it and move it off to the side while these intelligent cars kind of take over the road. <laughs> Here's Omnibub. This one is using soy-based plastics as its kind of uh, uh, solution for its uh, canopy. And here they are separating passenger condition, conditions from freight conditions, going vertically up a building. Here you can see it in a cluster connecting to the skyscraper cores and connecting uh, office space to office space. Um, we also wanted to make a car that you could eat, an edible car. And we thought, wow, great idea, finally something original. No, much to my chagrin, uh, the research that I found out is Henry Ford did it. He produced a vehicle uh, that was made of soy-based plastics grown in an experimental lab. He wanted to merge America's grand agricultural economy with its automobile economy. And here he is testing it out with an ax, a car grown from soy, and it bounces off the vehicle. Right? The body of the car for the press does not leave uh, 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 any kind of a scratch because the coloration is impregnated in the material. This is pretty fantastic. So we use all different si types of starch foams, air bladders, air quilts to make the car as soft as possible. Uh, in fact, the first principle of our designs, which is something that you can do when you're in academia, not necessarily working for a, a big corporate place, although I think there are many corporate places that have different <laughs> attitudes. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, here, the idea would be uh, our, our first principle, our first uh, uh, kind of signal of human intention would be that no one will ever die in a car accident again. So let's make cars go at a certain speed, right, 30 miles or less. Let's make every part of these uh, materials that go into them uh, uh, something that considers others on the road. Uh, this is a vehicle, it's basically a big uh, Nerf ball, I guess, uh, uh, you know, this is not actually my term, but, uh, you know, Colbert came up with that, and I'm going to use it, and I think it's right. These are Nerf cars, so if they hit your sister, they tickle her, they don't kill her. That's kind of the point. And they have radically new uh, systems applied to them to think about braking, to think about proximity, to think about a grammar of moving in, in flocks, right? So here is what we call the contact patch that's just below where the wheel touches the road. And we have the, in this case, that creates friction to stop a car. In this case, this vehicle, the entire belly of the car hits the road, increasing that friction by 10,000 fold. So a big soft car, kind of just like a beach ball, would fall on top of you if it doesn't completely stop. They go flaccid, you, because they're mostly made out of pneumatics or air-based systems. You can stack them like pancakes, pull them out like a surfboard with an attendant, and you've got your car. Here, this vehicle, I was thinking of, well, we, we had a new sponsor. In this case, uh, Reebok, they want to get into making the bodies for these very smart, omnidirectional, intelligent wheels. So we present the shoe car, and we thought that it would be pretty fantastic. Here it's got a, uh, you know, uh, what's most notable is the zipper to get in and out of the vehicle. 
uh, thank you, Europe. Here is a smart car. We don't use them enough here. 86 inches in length, right? Pretty fantastic in part perpendicular to the curb. Here's another version of our car. Same, same footprint. But remember, these two wheels articulate and the frame stands up so it's smaller than the smart car by 33%. You can park perpendicular to the curb and get off direct into the sidewalk. It considers the young and the old. There is a lip to, uh, uh, to get in and out of the vehicle. We consider it ingress and egress, kind of a canopy to protect you from the elements. And then fitting them into the street. And this no longer becomes a talk about cars. At this point, this is when we start thinking it's not about vehicles. In fact, vehicles are nowhere near as important anymore. What these are very big batteries on wheels, right? And if you have a certain critical mass of them, you can absorb peak demands and distribute loads of electricity or energy in a new kind of city grid. City grid that's always update, updatable and adaptable. So it's no longer the antiquated system that we have now, but a new system that's alive and fully integrated with something like mobility. So this is here showing that most of it would hopefully be culled from from alternative uh, uh, sources or renew renewable sources. Uh, eventually, you know, that would happen. Uh, and thinking about not only the energy uh, uh, coming from the vehicles being completely renewable, but other energy sources that we carry ourselves. Now, for moving around these soft kind of cars that are powered ultimately by electricity batteries, people always say, well, what about human health and the environment? Well, we have other versions. In this case, it's the New York City River Gym. It is powered by the human buttocks as you work out. That power is harnessed, trickles down to the drivetrain, and you move on a loop between, let's say, Brooklyn and Wall Street from locker room to locker room. So there are uh, ways to use human mobility for specific methods of transportation. And then here, uh, another form. And this was a, a kind of fantasy of air-based transportation. This was thinking about um, the Thanksgiving Day Parade, which you guys must know about here in New York. Uh, as a kid, it was purely startling. Uh, I was in love with Spider-Man. Uh, you know, now I see SpongeBob, etc. But you see about 50 people, sometimes 40, trying to hold down these balloons as they march endlessly through the streets, and then it stops. You know, after a couple of hours, and I'm thinking, well, why stop it? Let's just keep it going all day long, every day, down Fifth Avenue, down you know 10th, whatever you want to do. Let's harness that and use it as a transportation system, right? Keep a funicular. Uh, to, to make sure they don't get out of control. You hop on and hop off, go five blocks, go 40, 40 blocks of these gentle tendrils with soft ski lift-like chairs, and maybe an attendant to help those folks who can't get on it, but constantly moving at about 13 miles an hour. And then thinking about these same air-based systems where they can also help uh, support cleaning the atmosphere. Uh, and this is looking at docking stations, et cetera. And uh, this, 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 this narrative goes on for a long time. And then all of these kind of combined into something uh, that we call soft mobs and smart dots. That not only are all these things talking to one another and connected and, and radically new, but we privilege the most important thing about a city in movement, which is the pedestrian, the alpha position of the foot. It's the best interface for a city. And bicycling It's also a phenomenal invention. It doesn't need much more. So we privilege that. And we also give the road a bit of intelligence as well. In this case, the road would have a kind of a RFID tag system. If it senses a little girl who drops her ball on the street, right, the road can renegotiate traffic around that little girl and she could pick up her ball. But uh, you know, if you know anything about kids, once they know that they can do that, they'll you know, disrupt traffic all the time. So none of these systems are perfect, but we are certainly uh, folks thinking about them. Uh, and now the jetpack. Now the, the jetpack, and I, I told this story and it's absolutely true. I sat in a room with with a bunch of folks like yourself and some some uh, uh, other uh, other folks who are experts in urbanism, and someone I guess uh, someone said my kid brother uh, said uh, said look um, you know you've studied urban urbanism your entire life and city planning uh, I think that's great but but what happens when someone invents the jetpack right doesn't all that knowledge and, and all the things that you've done just simply go away and, and my colleague who was on the panel sort of dismissed that and said yeah ha ha ha. You know, that's, you know, whatever, not going to happen. And I thought, well, of, of course it's going to happen, right? At some level, sometime, we'll eventually have them. Who's thinking about it and what are the ramifications? And certainly we can't allow jetpack designers to design them. Why not architects and urbanists and scientists think about what that jetpack should be? And of course we want it to be soft. We want it to move in flocks and herds and be fairly intelligent. And there are jetpacks that you can buy today. Jetpack International, Martin Jetpacks for $100,000. You can buy a jetpack. It runs on hydrogen peroxide catalyzed by a metal. 
It can go for about, uh, you know, I, I think they're up to 20 minutes would be the maximum kind of traveling. But you can get from Newark, New Jersey to Wall Street in minutes as opposed to almost an hour in an SUV. And you don't have to park. And they, they move kind of like this, like a, a kind of like a they kind of float and, and another one can move and they can bounce into one another and you, know, <laughs> and you land and you unzip yourself and out you go to work. Uh, and, and we thought about, let's think, what, what, what kind of a society or what kind of a, a, a kind of a, 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 a form of mobility, what, what, what does this form of mobility do to the city? Uh, and, and, and thinking that, well, we must need kind of long range systems. So here is a sky tug that would take groups of them to go from, let's say, Boston to New York. And then you, you attenuate or you break off to get to your uh, local destination. Uh, and then thinking, uh, thinking about what, what Obama meant by the smart grid and what he could be doing that is the 100 percent self-sufficient, radically green solution when it comes to the smart grid fantasy that we all have for the United States of America. So we started thinking about, well, what's the problem with the grid in the first place? Well, that's what you see, I think, on your, your left, which is sprawl. Sprawl deals with going into green fields, spreading issues of, of energy, waste, food, water, etc., and rethinking sprawl into a linear urban model and how we could use that linear urban model, retool essentially the suburbs and put them on our existing pieces of infrastructure, our existing arteries of mobility, use them and fit them out with waste, food, water, energy, data, etc. And this would be the smart grid, a radical smart grid where populations are connected to our arteries of mobility. Right? So I don't care how people move in this particular kind of fashion. We are actually rebranding uh, white trash because the trailer is a phenomenal way to live, especially if you look at the life cycle analysis. It's, it's radically green. So here you would see a kind of series of trailers or combines moving or uh, any way you want to get your house moving. And here is geothermal, wind, uh, photovoltaic areas for food, data, high-speed transportation. And you move from city core to city core. You're, you're always within a 45 minute loop and you get the suburbs kind of moving and moving and moving. And the idea here uh, is actually not novel either. I had Margaret Crawford, head of theory at, at Harvard, uh, tell me at dinner that she's actually seen this before. It's actually been a serious proposal. In 1917, the Soviets, the disurbanists, decided that they wanted to do the exact same thing. Their populations outside of the peri-urban condition needed to be constantly moving, constantly mobile. And the reason for that is they wanted to avoid nuclear holocaust. So they wanted to keep those populations going. They didn't do it for reasons of the environment. So this has been a proposition that's been around. To, to pimp your house out like this with some kind of wheels costs about one-fourth the price of your home. So for about a uh, you know, $400,000 home, another 100000 you can get it moving uh, in any kind of fashion. And that's showing the suburbs leaving. And we built these just giant models that kind of express this form of movement. We call this project Homeway, the Great Suburban Exodus. And here we move from the linear kind of uh, suburb model to a city core. And you can see this kind of thing happening here, again, with, with areas that are, that are meant to be fit out for density and intensity and energy, food, etc. places to rest for a few months. So if you like Florida, you hang out there. You get bored of Miami because there's maybe not too many libraries and too many uh, you know, bathing suits. Uh, you go to New York and here you are moving in the, these homes along these streams. This would be an example of a, of a house party. So if you don't like your neighbor, you can confront him for just a couple of days, have a party, then you know, slowly drive away. <laughs> and then uh, another project that's uh, also has uh, been around, uh, this was called the Fab Tree Hab. This is also thinking radically about how we can be completely green. This is looking at a technology that's 2,500 years old. It is called pleaching. Uh, it's grafting trees together, actually woody plants, because you don't have to do it at the tree scale. You can use vines and other uh, matter that grows quicker. And I'll talk about that in a second. But essentially, the, the trees are grafted, whether it's same species or interspecies, into one contiguous vascular system. And this is, uh, I guess, our contribution to this is we use computer geometry. 
to make scaffolding, weave the plants through it while they're wet or while they're root taps, and we gently guide them into a very specific shape, a shape that's meant for dwelling. Then they're infilled with horsehair or cob or something or clay, and you make a kind of home. We have been experimenting with this uh, off and on since 2002. Here's one version on the roof in Brooklyn looking at willows, looking at issues of infestation from insects, lack of solar income, capillary activity in water, etc. And this would be a kind of a kind of fit out of the one of the entire homes. It doesn't have to be in the shape, it could be in any shape, but this is a home that is the landscape. It is fitted into the metabolism of its local environment. It is a contributor to, uh, to our atmosphere, not something that takes away, not a compromise, not a zero model, right? I'm not big on zero impact things. It's kind of like Switzerland. You know, it doesn't do good or bad, it's just kind of there. <laughs> yeah, any Swiss people here? This, all right. Well, this is not a neutral model. It's a positive ecological model. It is, one, it is responsible and accountable for 100 years of industrial pollution, and it scrubs and cleans the air. That's kind of point. You can pre-grow a village of these homes uh, you know, within seven to ten years. And I think that's fantastic, and that's been one of the crit criticisms. You actually, there's there's plants that are available now and trees. A company called Arborgen in Wisconsin can give us trees that will grow 80 feet in a year. Uh, the, this is this is interesting, but I'm not sure in the about doing that, especially in practice. We use the precautionary principle in science. We don't want to release genetically modified trees into the environment. We think we can do it with a piece of nature as it is, as it works, just fine guide it and shape it and that's it. it takes seven to ten years and people complain i don't want to wait that long for a house well i'd say you wait 12 years for a bottle of scotch i think we can wait <laughs> seven years for a home so here is a uh, one of our uh, well enough of the the vegetable home uh, we, we have been working uh, in, in a completely different home which is an experiment a series of questions and this is where we just like rachel have been taking on biology as a, as, a, as a much deeper topic in architecture and design. Uh, this is actually not a photo of the entire lab. The lab is, is a tripled in size now. There are seven biologists, do-it-yourself, uh, Biology New York, GenSpace, and Dr. Oliver Medvedic, who is over here leading this. We decide to kind of experiment with cells, molecular cell biology, and work on creating new geometries uh, for industrial design uses. uses. In this case, uh, you can imagine making leather belts or leather shoes from cells that you print where no creature is harmed, no sentient being is hurt. It's kind of a victimless industrial design procedure. One way to do it is modified inkjet printers. Printing a geometry from the computer, clumps of cells can form shapes that you fold up around uh, polyglycaic acid scaffolds here, for instance, forming a bladder. This has been around in regenerative medicine since 2001. Uh, this is essentially for folks who've got uh, cancer and you replace their bladder with this particular element. You can replace esophagi, cartilage and knees, etc. You can also use keratin cells like fingernails and all different types of materials to make other things. When we heard we can control geometry and make shapes, we went for it. We started a proposition of doing it at the house scale. Performing acts of, of synthetic biology at this scale has not been done before. And we were looking at the limitations of our equipment, producing a grammar for, for, for dealing with those limitations, and making a home that would be grown out of meat cells, or in this case, uh, pig cells. So this is, this is what you'd see a typical stud wall in, in any home in America. And then our, our meat house proposition which is a, a very different kind of tectonic solution. Here, looking at fatty cells as insulation, cilia for wind loads, and you know, we, we, I think uh, we've, we've known this before, but sphincter muscles for doors and windows, thought that just this seems to be the best possible solution if we're gonna make a house of meat. And yes, it would be cleaned and we bleach the door, I guess, before you get in. <laughs> and it's, you know, it, this is one possible shape. It could be any shape. Making it a Victorian or an English tutor would just be wrong. So this thing that, that seemed to you know, make a spectacle of the, the kind of the, the anus entryways and windows were, we were all for it. And this is the version that we have for the lab. It is essentially, if you think of the cost of doing something like this from regenerative medicine, uh, you, you, you can't keep it alive. You're producing, uh, printing pig cells at a, into a specific geometry, and then you saturate them in nitrates and sulfates and preservatives because you can't keep it alive. It has no immunological system. It has no skeletal system. It has uh, no, no, no kind of uh, blood vessels to keep it healthy. As soon as, it's, as, it, as it, that it's exposed to the atmosphere, it dies. So we wanted it to be constantly preserved, just like beef jerky. We, and it's 
very expensive to do something like that. We're very happy with what we got. It's, it's, it's been alive for, I guess, three or dead for about three years. It hasn't rotted. Uh, it's like a Twinkie. It's got a <laughs> shelf life forever. And we know about the issues that it brings up. The point is experimentation. The point is to find some questions and, and attack them, look for more of those answers. So we had a big show in Prague, and we, we put the meat house in front of the cathedral so religion can confront this, you know, this monster. And then finally, thinking about the cities and cityscape. Uh, this is something my, my daughter is completely in love with the, this, this robot, the most affable robot on Earth. He's a nonstop Nebuchadnezzar, piling trash all day long into specific shapes. So the same thing, automate a, a kind of a puzzle-fitting system for waste. Instead of cells, it would be waste-based systems. So we looked at the city of New York. Again, more research here going from 1613 when Indians were around zero tons of trash per day, at least that we know of, to today, 36,000 tons of trash today produced in the city of New York. If I was an alien race peering down at Earth with a, some kind of telescope, I would think that the city, especially New York, was invented to make waste. That's <laughs> what we do. So we're looking at this as a kind of a resource. Waste is a resource. Waste is a nutrient to be automated and controlled to produce new architecture, new civic spaces, new ways of thinking about the city. Uh, here's a kind of chart of the research. Can't possibly unpack all of that very quickly, but we looked at the policies that have been in place from ocean dumping to McDonald's stopping hamburger boxes or, or styrofoam clamshells and looking at off-the-shelf technologies that are basically just like Wally. These are bale makers or crushers that can take all sorts of things from plastics to cardboard and make them into dumb boxes. We're thinking modify their jaws ever so slightly, make them into puzzle fitting shapes that can produce archways or corbelled domes or new kinds of architecture, puzzle fitting bricks, kind of like Legos made from waste. And here's a kind of drawing that I think tries to explain or show visually to the, uh, the, 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 the everyday American, the amount of waste we produce in an hour in the city of New York. It's more than the Statue of Liberty. This is the amount of compacted waste in one hour in the city of New York. I did a model for the MoMA, also kind of showing the same thing. And thinking about separating the uses of, of that waste from here, uh, the plastics or clear-based waste could be used for fenestration. Uh, organic matter can be used as temporary scaffolds to hold up the inorganic matter, and then it rots away. They would be mining it with all sorts of processes. And then looking at doing an entire skyscraper made out of compacted waste. So here's a 53-story tower that we call One Day Tower because it takes 24 hours of waste in the city of New York and makes a 53-story skyscraper. So we're kind of showing the waste being delivered, constantly produced. Uh, we've got all sorts of interesting things, vertical gardens, jetpack ports, etc. And this is our kind of rapid refuse tower. And then this becomes a theory of a new kind of city. A city that moves from the age of industrialization to the age of consumerism to an age of recovery where we mine our waste and use it to retrofit our buildings. And then finally, a city where there is no waste. Waste has gone away. Right? Gertrude Stein said it best. Away has gone away. We want to make a city where nothing is tossed out. Everything is constantly created and upcycled. So you go to a city of, uh, of, of industrialization to a city of creation to creation to creation. And focusing that specifically on one area in New York, uh, the Lower East Side or Lower East Side, and looking at many other aspects besides waste, but all of these things confronting uh, one another, waste, food, water, energy, all thinking about the city in, in, in a finer kind of detail. We did this for the History Channel. Uh, the base principle here for, for, for this kind of a city is over a period of time, 100 years, we'll reverse the figure ground and do something that we haven't actually done, which is make green space, but not dumb, naive green space, productive green space, green space that deals with our energy needs, deals with the, the things that we need to survive. Make a city that's 100% right, self-sufficient within its political boundaries, a city with no inputs or outputs, a city that's entirely self-contained. Uh, here we are rethinking a Kentucky Fried Chicken, so kind of a vertical uh, a farm slash space to sell uh, food. Uh, and then the entire figure ground of the city of Manhattan switched over. Where buildings used to be, we replaced them with productive green spaces. And where the streets are, we place them in with uh, buildings. Here you can see some of those details. And here's a, a view of Central Park in the future dealing with food and changing Central Park. So that would be able to feed the 9 million people that we capped the population in. 
and then looking at the energy use of this particular city, and we move this over to Brooklyn. And this is, and if you've probably heard this argument before, if New York City was the 51st state in the United States, it would be the greenest, most sustainable state in the entire continent, period. Right? This is the amount of megawatts per hour that the average person uses in the United States at 63, and in New York City today, it's at 42 is pretty great. That's mostly due to the lack of, of, of petroleum and moving around in cars and shared stack effects in energy. If you heat your apartment, the guy above you, Vinny, gets some of that heat. And when he heats his apartment, etc. If you're in the suburbs and you heat your building, it goes out into the atmosphere. So we had looked at the, the energy systems, the food systems, uh, 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 the waste systems, and the mobility systems that make up the city of Brooklyn. And I guess this is a kind of our, our last project. These last few images I'll show you just kind of describe what Brooklyn would look like in a future that is 100% self-sufficient, where uh, there are no inputs and outputs, and it's a radically green city side there. So you can see here, uh, there are some statistics about making it run completely on solar, for instance. Uh, that would mean uh, all of Staten Island and 18% of the land area of Brooklyn would be all solar cells, running at 23% efficiency. It would meet the megawatt usages that we would need. All right, but that would be absurd just to use solar cells in that fashion. There are 3,000 acres of unshaded roof space in the city of New York where we could fit those solar panels to. And we don't just have to use sun. We certainly can use wind, geothermal, and water-based energies to rethink of our city, a city that runs on pure renewables. So we're doing this to get, basically, uh, you know, I love Bloomberg's plan for a green New York. I think that it has some things that are impossible to argue with in that plan, like everyone will be 10 minutes from a park in about 50 years from now in the city of New York. And I think that's, that's great. Uh, but what does it mean to be radically green in the city of New York? What does it look like? What are the numbers? And, and how do you fit it out? And it must be kind of fabulous. So I'm going to end on, on this particular uh, view of us urbaneering Brooklyn to be completely green. And I think uh, it's, uh, I'll take some questions. So thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. seem to be picking, but just on that slide, just a couple back, mm -hmm. you said something about 42 megawatts per person per day? Per, per hour. hour. Yeah. Per, per hour? Yeah. What is that energy being used for? That's a lot of energy. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's taking into account everything. So that's commercial uses, that's industrial uses, that's, that's taking the population of the entire United States and the amount of energy that we use and cutting it up exactly like that. And then capping the population of New York, knowing the entire energy the city of New York uses, cutting it up per population. So there's there are probably like some folks. Million people and like it's like 300 million ones. people. Yeah. And then population of the United States. Thousands of terawatts? If we don't have the generator. That, 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 that much energy. That's something wrong with that, it seems. Oh, uh, <laughs> well. Carry it. I, I'm pretty sure that's the exact number. Uh, I, I don't. I can't. It, it seems to be off by like multiple orders of magnitude. Yeah, there's a few orders of magnitude. Possible even from the energy output from the sun. There's yeah, no, that, that's true. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe it is per day. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think that that's uh, pretty much the numbers that we got. But now that I'm doing it. Let me I mean, I refer back to the slide, but let's yeah, look yeah, there. Yeah. Maybe that was like a future In order to magnitude. No, no, no. It's, 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 no, no, we, we just did it this summer, so it looks it looked right, and I don't want to screw it up. Yeah, oh, per year, sorry. Okay, that's my fault. Uh, what does it say? Per year. Per year. year. Oh, yes. okay. That's more like it. <laughs> Brain fart. It happens. Yeah. Okay, that's so good. Good, good question. Thank you. <laughs> they don't want to be nitpicking. I just. Yeah, I think companies that actually implementing. Some of these ideas that like Bloomberg has been talking about for years, like the Bloomberg Green Deal. Um, well, you know, so we certainly do advise companies uh, and help them on uh, in problems that they they've had difficult difficulties creating solutions for. Uh, we we kind of take on any particular subject. I mean, between the group of us, it doesn't really seem we have any sort of limits per se. 
we, we would take on, for instance, FedEx would have a problem with uh, parking tickets in the city of New York. And they needed to deal with issues of mobility, issues with urbanism, issues with uh, kind of technology. And they, they certainly have a great staff working for them, but they needed somebody to figure out some answers on, on their own. So we kind of looked at their problem, parking tickets in the city of New York, and thought, well, why not have these FedEx trucks uh, hire one or two more people on the truck and never stop, constantly keep them moving, and never make a left turn in the city of New York? So not only does it get more employees, but uh, uh, it, kind of, it kind of solves the problem in the simplest possible way. Uh, and we don't always look for radically out of the box kind of solutions. We've been asked uh, before from the Obama administration, what can we do right now, right now that's an off the shelf technology to, to deal with the, 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 the energy suck in the United States? And it's simple, change the light bulbs. Go out, change the light bulbs. We can save 45% of the energy usage. That doesn't mean people do it. That's been known for you know years. Uh, uh, there's now policy about changing those light bulbs, and I know there's some issues about mercury, but they're not as bad as you think. Uh, the bottom line is that why aren't Americans doing it? They're simply not excited about going out and changing some light bulbs. I, that might be it. There's probably a whole host of other issues, but uh, it's certainly available. We use 10,000 lumens per square foot on a desk in an office. There's no reason for something like that. So a lot of the solutions we, 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 we look towards, we actually go for the easy answer. Maybe the kind of the, the hack answer, if you want to say it. But those, those work. Uh, and, and, and some of the things that we look at are, are, are about um, desire lines, propositions or reifications of the city that we'd like to see in the near future that are based on technologies that we find uh, available today. I don't think more or less anything we've shown doesn't exist in some fashion. And I think it's a, the, the, the kind of narrative that we find in, in science fiction that we're actually in love with. Science fiction used to be slightly poo-pooed. I think if you'd mentioned that before, people would get slight, you know, upset. Uh, but if you look at the history of science fiction, its contribution to humanity is immense. Uh, you can go all the way back to Jules Verne, right? Hundreds of years ago, he, was, he, he wrote a narrative, not a promissory narrative. He didn't make any promises. He just said, here's a narrative about getting to the moon. And he got into the entire culture of how that would happen. And he imagined it would be a staged rocket that would leave from Florida, that would drop off elements, land on the moon, return with a different capsule that would go through the atmosphere and would land in the water. And you can imagine 100 years later, the engineers at NASA directed by Kennedy to go to the moon. They said, well, you know, what are some ideas? They probably read Jules Verne, said, well, let's, you know, let's see if this works out. Did some numbers and started being more and more convinced that that's the way to do it. I think that that's, it's, it, it stays in our hearts and our minds and our imagination. The more popular it is, actually, the, the, the probably more likely it is to find itself uh, reaching fruition. That's, that's also in telecommunications. As a kid watching Star Trek, I never believed I would have a handheld computer that I can talk to anyone in the world with. Uh, well, actually, I sort of did believe that. So I wasn't so surprised when, <laughs> when we've got them. So, so some of the technologies that we show, like the cars, which are off the shelf and readily available, it's, it's a matter of it being exciting and fabulous and leapfrogging a previous technology. It's a, a kind of the first adopters buy it, and when they do, people see that it's cool, radical, and different, and the log jam opens up, and it just starts to flow, and many other people jump on board with these kinds of things. I mean, Apple's a company that's been very successful with that kind of an attitude. Do you have a question, sir? Yes, one thing. We have to exit the space by 7.30, so for people who want to look at the exhibit, you have uh, seven minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so you can pick either ask questions or look at the exhibit, but we have to be out. Can I ask my question? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, I'm wondering what happens to a sense of history? Like, it seems like culturally we're, we're attached to buildings and, you know, like you're, in your proposal you're preserving the whole city, and it seems like in your kind of proposition it's destruction and restructure of everything in a, in a green way, yeah. but uh, like one is the, the destruction of the transformation into this green city, and two is like what about the nostalgia and the idea of memory and um, history that culturally people have. Right. I, well, what, what I didn't have time to say is that we do preserve a history of, to, of, of architectural topology in anything that we're changing. We, uh, historic preservation is essential. Uh, and we do keep a lot of the buildings, for instance, in the Lower East Side project 
if they're if they're going to be around in 300 years from now, their structures are are that robust, we keep them. If it's something that's you know is built in the 70s and looks like it's going to rot away tomorrow, uh, and is and, and is also a major energy uh, polluter, we'll take it down. So we've got to do a kind of audit of what's going to be worth preserving and what's not going to be worth preserving. A sense of history is, I mean, is 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 actually. Uh, Super important. I think Rachel has, has achieved that in, in her work as well. Uh, I, I think that there's there's no doubt we have to keep it and preserve it as much as possible. But uh, and that's something that I have to kind of communicate directly. When I'm talking about it's just so much I can say at the moment. Yeah. I have a question for Rachel. Oh. Do we need a mic anymore? You, you had mentioned you had mentioned um, having and I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Well, a matter of just conditions and ingredients? Or, um, um, so, um, unpublished work, but essentially you can reduce fusion and fission of protocells with really, really simple ingredients. In fact, what I, what I haven't shown you is some of the contemporary work that's going on with a, another group of synthetic agents, which are based on inorganic chemistry. So, the, uh, the team that we work with at the um, University of Glasgow, the Cromian Group, are determined to get a Nobel Prize for creating the first inorganic chemistry um, as, as a life form. Um, and essentially, so, so essentially, you know, there, there are these, these um, uh, species that we're now starting to design from this, um, from, a, from a, um, a, a, a bottom up perspective, and uh, you know, we're using lots of different ingredients to create. Um, Different outcomes, but it's essentially because we're designing them from the bottom up, we can pretty much control, um, you know, within the realms of how far you can control a complex system that's very simple. Um, but, you know, whether, whether or not we can create more of them. I mean, obviously, the technologies are young, but we, we can do it. We, we can do it. At the moment, we'll rely on um, digital printing, you know, 3, 3D printing, 2D printing, in order to be the birthing agents. Um, because we'll want to specifically locate them in, in, in time and space. But you know, once we start getting a manu manufacturing platform that we can then uh, get data off, we'll, we'll have a lot more information about e exactly what we need to do to, to, to create. So then you, you could have a self-sustaining colony. You, you could provide you know, the nutrients there, but also you could get colonies that that you know, did, did different things but connected in different ways. So the metabolism or the waste products of one becomes the food for the next, uh, which might um, stimulate uh, um, uh, growth or repair in another one. Um, you know, so at the moment, a lot of synthetic biology is following the principles of biology. Also, the biomimicry is, is, is very is very strong. There's uh, other groups working with these protocells are actually trying to um, take receptors from existing biological cells and stick them into the membranes of these, um, well, actually not, not membranes, on the surface of the oral water droplet systems. Um, so you will get biological synthetic hybrids. Not only that, these, these agents actually, I think, take off where nanotechnology didn't quite get it. In other words, it's got a, a matrix, and one of the things that I would be, you know, so it's got the software to, to, to communicate across distance between um, you know, um, elements that, 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 that are part of a, of a complex ecology. So essentially the kinds of things we want to do is to actually use the, the oil system um, and put nanostructures in there and see whether or not actually we can get dynamic dialogues going on between um, uh, you know, engineered nanostructures. Right, um, but then yeah. as somebody else put up, you responded that I think I that um, somebody brought up the idea that can this get out of hand? So and you brought up that, that um, well, there's no DNA. Yeah, no DNA. And, but nevertheless, though, one can see that theoretically, you could have a situation where it gets out of hand. Because if, uh, if the environment changes, and, well, not only the environment, the protocells change, then their, their demands on the environment and their change and your ability then to control them needs to change in response to that and you know everybody's got to keep up um, 
testament by I'm, I'm not sure if I'm articulating yeah. that right. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand what you're saying. You so you could have, like, like you did say, I mean, this is, this is close to just a completely different form of life. Correct, and also, you know, it's, it's right at the origins, right at the origins of life. So, um, a bit like early Earth, it's probably going to be extinguished many, many, many times before we actually get systems that are uh, integrated sufficiently, yeah, to, 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 to weather a lot of environmental variation. Um, right now, they're being incredibly uh, overly. Or they, or they could be just extremely lucky. They could be extremely lucky. So, I mean, you know, en engineered and so I, th I think, think the key principle here is about design. So, um, you know, finding the right context for these to exist actually was one of the things that we tried to do quite early on with choosing the site of Venice as being a meaningful way to start articulating a possibility before, before they kind of say, and, and this, is, this, is the, this is the technology, because I just produced a a, a, an agent that's disembodied that is, is alien that has these lifelike properties, it's immediately a, a scary proposition. So really think of it as being a, a, a material proposition that can be designed. At the moment, you know, the scale is going to be really small. Uh, it's incredibly fragile. Uh, it's going to need a, um, uh, consideration to, to, and, and lots of monitoring and development in order to get to the next stage. But, but we will get there, and I think it does raise important questions about control, about ethics, about what we think life is, and about our relationship and responsibility with the environment. I see a neo gaia coming back as opposed to, um, you know, the, uh, you know this, this idea that you know, we inhabit the surface of the, uh, of the surface, uh, surface of the earth and we're quite separate from everything else. I think that these technologies will actually start to um, uh, display our, our you know, global collectivity, not just between people, but also between life forms as well. We're out of time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.